This video is sponsored by Blinkist. Go to Blinkist.com slash pensioncraft to get a week's free trial and 25% off premium membership. When I speak to clients one-to-one, -one, we don't just talk about financial markets. A big part of our conversation is about how not to invest. And that's to do with the psychology of investing and also how to overcome our cognitive biases. So in this video, we're going to look at some of those biases and how to overcome them. And in that way, we can become better investors. So let's look at the psychology of investing in a bit more detail. The first problem arises from the fact that our experience is limited. We don't have any control over when we're born and when we die, and that controls when we invest. And if you're lucky enough to have invested during a boom time, when equity markets, for example, were very strong, then your experience of equity will be a very positive one. Whereas other people will have lived through awful experiences of economic hardship and depression. And during those periods, equity markets probably performed very poorly. And people who've lived through that sort of experience will have a much more negative attitude towards equity investing. There's a great paper by Malmendier and Nagel, which was published in 2009, called Depression Babies. Do macroeconomic experiences affect risk-taking? And what they found was, indeed they do. For those people who've experienced low equity market returns during their lifetime, they generally found that these people were less willing to take financial risk, that they were less likely to buy stocks in the first place, and when they did, they tended to buy less equity as a proportion of their portfolio. So how can we overcome this bias which is based on our own restricted experience of equity markets? I think Julia Galef has come up with a beautiful framework for thinking our way through this problem. She distinguishes between two completely separate mindsets. The first one is what she calls the soldier mindset. Now the soldier is there to protect a belief system. Reasoning is seen as something which is like combat. And if you're wrong, that's seen as a defeat. If that's the case, then you'll seek out evidence which will confirm your beliefs so that your entrenched beliefs remain in place. What she suggests is a better mindset, which she describes as the scout mindset. Because the job of a scout is to go ahead of the other troops and to create a map of what's actually there. And in this case, reasoning is more like map making. If that's your attitude, then when you're wrong, all that happens is you simply improve your map. It's updated to reflect the reality of what's out there. And consequently, when you seek out evidence, it'll be to improve your map, not to entrench beliefs which are already there. Another way to think about this is we're simply curators of beliefs. The beliefs have nothing to do with us. They're simply what we believe at the current time based on the evidence that we've found. Another benefit of this mindset is that when someone contradicts your belief, it's not an attack on you. It's simply an opportunity for you to reassess your map of the world. And perhaps you're wrong. Perhaps you do have to update your beliefs. And we might summarise that by saying that you should ground your beliefs in evidence. And it's also a good idea to seek out evidence which contradicts your beliefs because that way you can broaden your experience and stress test your belief system. One of the tools I use for my research a great deal is Blinkist. And what's really useful about it is that it gives me a kind of subscription access to thousands of books. And what it does is to condense those books into very short bite-sized summaries, which are called Blinks. Usually there are about five to 10 Blinks per book. These are non-fiction books, so they're certainly related to what I talk about, which is investment and psychology. And I can either read the book or I can listen to it in audio format. So this is what the interface looks like on my iPad. And you can see that it's got these kind of categories at the top. So you can search by subject. It gives you a summary of the latest blinks. And it's also got these things called shortcasts, which are like audio podcasts, but usually about 10 minutes in length. And you can see the latest trending blinks as well. So the one I just referred to, which is by Julia Galef, I read the blink on Blinkist. And that's the Scout mindset. So this is what my library looks like. You can see the books I've been reading recently. If I want to see The Psychology of Money, which is the book which I'm primarily using for this video, you can see the summary of the book here. These are the blinks which make up the book. There are eight of them. And I can look up a little bit about the author, Morgan Housel. 
and I can see similar blinks. So if I enjoy this book, The Psychology of Money, these are related titles. And this is what one of the blinks looks like if I want to read it. So very compact, very easy to digest. And one feature I like is that they sometimes put in a quote from the book which is very memorable. So this one says, not all success is due to hard work, not all poverty is due to laziness. Keep this in mind when judging people, including yourself. And this was actually a letter from Morgan Housel, which he wrote to his son when he was born, which I thought was quite sweet. Now, if we go back to the first blink, a really cool feature is that if I'm out walking Teddy, I can just listen to the audio version of each of the blinks. But the search is also really good in Blinkist, so that if I wanted to find a book by Kahneman, Thinking Fast and Slow, you can see it's listed here, and I just click on the book here, and I can read the blink, or I can listen to the blink. Now, all of the books which I use to research this video are available as blinks. So if you want to try out Blinkist for yourself, there's a link in the description so that viewers of Pension Craft get a seven-day free trial and you get 25% off a premium membership. A related problem is recency bias. There's a regular survey which is carried out by the asset manager Natixis where they ask investors what returns they expect for equity above the rate of inflation. Now for the US equity market, that's around 7% above inflation. And if you look at the survey result in 2014, it wasn't far wrong. It was around 9%, a little bit above that 7%, but still not too high. But you can see what happened gradually over time as we had an incredibly strong global equity market rally. Recent market experience showed investors that equity markets were great and returns were around 10% over those years. So what gradually happens is that expectations crept upward year by year. Now the global average expectation for financial professionals is 5.3%. I think that's a bit too bearish. But the global average expectation for investors is almost three times that at 14.5%. And the survey also breaks it down by country. And in the US, again, you can see that expectations are roughly three times what financial professionals would expect. Investors in the UK are even more bullish. And the least bullish country is Germany, where the expectation gap is still over 100%. Individual investors are twice as bullish as financial professionals. So beneath me, you can see the actual numbers for the S&P 500 once we reinvest dividends, so it's a total return, and once we adjust for inflation, so it's a real total return. And what we find is, on average, that's been a little bit below 7% historically. Now the parts shaded in red are when the 10 year average return is above that 7% average. And the blue parts are when the 10 year average return is less than the long term average. And it's no surprise that the recent 10 year returns, which you can see beneath me, are strongly red. We've had a very strong equity rally, which has fed investor optimism. But it's made those expectations grow far too optimistic. And the way that we'd overcome this bias, which is our recency bias, is to focus on long-term returns. That way we can anchor our expectations much more realistically about what could happen in the future. And it's really important to think about what enough means for you. Morgan Housel captures the problem beautifully when he says that capitalism is good at two things, generating wealth and generating envy. And he relates a story which Jack Bogle always used to quote, which was a conversation between two great novelists, which I love, Kurt Vonnegut and Joseph Heller. They were attending a swanky party, which was hosted by a really wealthy hedge fund manager. And Vonnegut made a fairly barbed comment to Heller. He said, our host has made more in a single day than your best-selling book, Catch-22, has made over its entire history. But Heller replied, yes, but I have something he'll never have enough. It's easy to get caught up in trying to generate huge returns, whereas what you should be doing is working back from your goals of what enough means to you. And for many people, they don't need huge returns to achieve that lifestyle, as long as they save reasonable amounts of money. And Morgan Housel relates the story of Rajat Gupta, who started off life very poor growing up in India, but through amazing academic achievements, he managed to move to the US, he joined the company McKinsey, and eventually became its CEO. And he became a very wealthy man. In fact, he started up his own hedge fund called Galleon. 
So it was utterly shocking in 2012 when Gupta was sentenced to two years in jail for insider trading. And the case was based on many calls he made to an employee at Galleon, and that was Raj Rajaratnam. There were several counts of insider trading, but we'll focus on one of them to do with Goldman Sachs. Now in 2008, Goldman was in trouble because it had taken too much leverage and it had lost a lot of money on some of its assets. So it was actually not too far from bankruptcy. So they needed to recapitalize. They needed an equity injection to ensure the company would survive. So the board of Goldman had a meeting with Warren Buffett who agreed he'd make an investment which would shore up their equity position. Then on September the 23rd, 2008, Goldman Sachs held a board meeting to discuss the deal from Warren Buffett. Now Gupta was on the board of Goldman Sachs and he dialed into that meeting. And one minute after the meeting ended, he called Rajaratnam. The entire call lasted just 30 seconds, but at 3.57, which was three minutes before markets closed, Mr. Rajaratnam bought 100,000 Goldman shares. Now, of course, if Warren Buffett is bailing out Goldman, you'd expect the share price to rise. This was market moving information, and it was intended that it would be announced after the market close. And Rajaratnam's assistant said that after the call, Mr. Rajaratnam was smiling more. Now, both Mr. Gupta and Mr. Rajaratnam were both very wealthy people. Rajaratnam himself received about $200 million for his work for Galleon in 2007. And Forbes magazine said he was the 236th richest man in America. But the fundamental problem here was that both of these men didn't have a good sense of enough. There will always be someone who's richer than you. So you don't want to compare yourself to them. You should focus instead on what lifestyle will make you happy. And always remember that enough is not too little. One of the surprising things about markets is that tails drive everything. Here's a great quote from Brad Pitt who says he's been banging away at this thing for 30 years, acting, and he says the simple math is some projects work and some don't. There's no reason to belabor either one, just get on to the next. Even for such a successful actor, he could never predict whether a film would be hugely successful or not, but the trick is just to generate lots of films, and eventually one will be a runaway success. Another great example which Morgan Housel gives in his book is to do with Disney. Now, Walt Disney published Steamboat Willie, which was his breakthrough cartoon in 1928. And by the mid-30s, Walt Disney had made over 400 cartoons, most of which lost a fortune. But then one film, Snow White, changed the entire fortune of Walt Disney and his company. In the first six months after the film was released, it grossed $8 million. That was an order of magnitude more than any other film he'd ever released. So for Disney, the 83 minutes of Snow White were all that mattered. So this single tail event, which is what statisticians call rare events, was the turnaround point for Walt Disney. How does this relate to equity markets? Well, if you look at venture capital companies, and this is statistics published by Correlation Ventures, what they found in a database of over 21,000 financings of small companies was that two thirds of them returned nothing. They were failures. But the reason why venture capital is still profitable despite that terrible success rate is the very tiny tail, which you can see beneath me where the returns were between 20 to 50 times in 1% of the cases, and in some very rare cases, just 0.4%, the return was 50 times or more. So again, you can see the tail beneath me is what drives the return in this business. JP Morgan Asset Management published an incredible report in which they tracked the fate of thousands of companies in America between 1980 and 2014. And they looked at the lifetime returns of the company from the day the stock was issued till the day the company went bankrupt or got merged or to the present day. And what they found was a huge amount of catastrophic loss, where catastrophic loss was defined as a 70% decline from its peak value with a minimal recovery from that crash. And it turned out that affected 40% of all US stocks. And if we look at that lifetime excess return relative to the broad market, that would be the excess lifetime return. 
the median or typical value was minus 54%. And for two thirds of the stocks in the US, the returns were below the market. So if you bought a stock at its IPO and just held it, two thirds of the time you'd underperform the Russell 3000, the broad equity market in the US. But the reason why the Russell 3000 index isn't a disaster is because of that extreme tale of huge winners. So many of the people I speak to think what they're trying to do is find these extreme winners. But that's extremely difficult to do. Firstly, they're very rare. But secondly, even professional managers seldom find these stocks. It's just not obvious. It's actually very difficult to beat the market. And consequently, for most people, what I think is best is not to try to find the needle in the haystack, those single hugely outperforming stocks, you just buy the whole haystack, as Jack Bogle said in his little book of common sense investing. And by buying the haystack, what he means is that you buy a global index tracker. That way you can ensure that you own that hugely outperforming tail and that pushes up your returns over the long term. Some of the people I speak to have sold a business or received an inheritance and they're now quite wealthy. You might have thought that would be a cause for joy, but for many of them, it's a source of great worry because what they're worried about is staying wealthy. And Morgan Housel relates the story of Rick Guerin. Now, it turns out that he was one of the founding partners of Berkshire Hathaway alongside Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger. And Monish Pabrai, whose tweet you can see beside me here, actually made friends with Rick Guerin and played bridge with him. Pabrai got to have lunch with Warren Buffett. And one of the questions he asked him was, what happened to Rick? And Warren Buffett's reply, as always, was very informative. He said that what happened to Rick was that there was a downturn in 1973 to 1974. So the equity market was down hugely during those years and Rick had a leveraged position. That's when you borrow money to invest money. And that amplifies your returns, both on the upside and the downside. Now, if equity markets fall and you have a leveraged position, then you have to post margin and Rick didn't have enough money to pay his margin call. So the way he generated the cash to do that was to sell his Berkshire Hathaway stocks. And Warren Buffett bought his stocks for $40 a piece. Here's the price of Berkshire Hathaway stock over the last 25 years or so, and I've marked the $40 line beneath me here with the dashed red line. Now, if he didn't have a levered position and he hadn't had to sell his Berkshire stock, each of those shares in Berkshire Hathaway would now be worth $420,000. And if we look at the return of the S&P 500 since the 1970s, you can see the crisis period that Warren was talking about in this red line beneath me. It's almost invisible. So by trying to boost his returns in the 1970s, Rick Guerin missed out massively on all the upside that followed. And that's because he was wiped out by that 50% fall in the 1973-74 crash. Even if he'd have just bought the S&P rather than Berkshire Hathaway, he'd have made very good returns. So investing is not about generating big returns over the short term. Don't focus on those stocks which give you 10 times returns, the 10 baggers. That's not the game that wins long term. Instead, you should just be looking to generate good returns, not great returns, for a long period of time. That's much more likely to be sustainable and successful. So the solution here is to be a little bit paranoid and plan for those market crashes. If you have lots of leverage, you could be wiped out. Just surviving with reasonable returns for a long period of time is the game that will win. So I hope at least some of those points resonated with you and they help you overcome your cognitive biases. And if you do want to read some of those books on Blinkist, there's a special offer for our viewers where you get a seven day free trial and you get a 25% discount on premium membership. And the link to that will be in our description. And as always, thank you for listening.